Man like Mark Sullivan, worry yourself. Stay tuned for the chilling episode. Woo! A positive mental attitude can clear away all obstacles which stand between you and your major purpose in life. This is the Snowboard Project featuring Mark Sullivan and the Beat. The Snowboard Project. The The Snowboard snowboard project. Project. The Snowboard Project. Welcome back to the Snowboard Project. I'm Mark Sullivan. And I'm the Beat. We're coming at you with another episode of the Snowboard yeah. Project. Who do we got on here today? So, Lee, you want to introduce him? Oh, man, we got a very special guest today. This guy is an extremely dedicated snowboarder to the point that he's won two Olympic gold medals. He owns one of the most legendary companies in snowboarding, Winter Stick. And I believe he is a multi-time winner of the Mount Baker Bank Slalom. I'm talking about Seth Westcott. Good morning, guys. <laughs> hey, how's morning, it going, Seth? Seth? Good. So how many times have you won Baker, Seth? Uh, that was only the second time. I've got six rolls of duct tape and a couple other fourths and a fifth. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was the second gold. Okay. So let's talk about the Mount Baker Bank Slalom because you're just rolling off a win literally last week. It looks like you won by about – I don't know, 20 one hundredths of a second. So a narrow victory, but uh, but still a victory nonetheless. What what was Baker like this year? What was the course like? Uh, the course was pretty rowdy this year. Um, we got there. I went down early. I've like kind of my new habit is going down on like Tuesday night, so I can uh, hang out with the course crew, spend time with Gwen if she's got any like questions on you know thinking about how things are going to run like the last I don't know this is probably like four or five years in a row now of just kind of like taking more time to be down there then if the snow is good I've got some time to go hike on the arm and get more free riding in and um so yeah I went down Tuesday night kind of a couple days ahead of the family just so I could like you know get a couple nights of rest and um and yeah we started riding the course in on Wednesday uh it was super soft i was thinking that uh it was just gonna be kind of like epic smooth flowy year and then uh by thursday we'd gotten down to like the last rain event that had happened here kind of in late january and i think baker had just gotten a little more than we did up here in whistler like when i got back from japan on the 21st of january we had a nice solid crust in the yard here in whistler and so i think that was kind of what we got down to for the racing conditions and it was pretty glacial underneath so uh kind of kind of reminded me of being at home in maine so that was good <laughs> <laughs> so is that an advantage having grown up on riding hard pack conditions kind of your early career and having a choppy chewed up and frozen bank solemn course yeah, I think it helps. Um, I don't know. It's it's funny because the two, you know, now like with the two wins, like the first one in 2013, it was kind of like one of those epic flowy smooth years where you could just be like gaining speed the whole time. And this year was definitely survival riding. So it was kind of like the two ends mm. of the spectrum. But uh, yeah, I think all the years on East Coast hard pack didn't hurt. So, so how many like practice runs do you take down the bank solemn course before you actually try to set a time trial time or try to actually time yourself down it? Basically just one. Um, yeah, I got one run down on Wednesday and then, uh, Thursday I had to run into Bellingham to go get groceries for the family and kind of get the house organized before they got down. So I, I missed the training on Thursday and then, uh, got one inspection run where you kind of go at like, 20% speed on Friday morning and then it's just straight into it. So it's kind of crazy because it is, it's like something I look forward to all year. And ultimately like I got four runs on the course total this year. So (laughs) it's a lot of effort and mental preparation and stuff for very little riding time. Right. So what kind of board did you ride this year for the win? Um, I was, I was on uh, my signature winter stick. I was on a 64. I brought a 60 and a 64 just because 
you kind of never know. Like last year, the upper six turns were so tight that the larger board wouldn't quite work. So, um, but I adjusted the I adjusted the taper a little bit. I was on a 20 mil taper the last few years and I took it back to just 15. So I had a little more mm. radius at the end of the turn to be able to finish some turns. Okay. So it sounds like you're actually custom building bank slalom boards. What makes a good bank slalom board? <laughs> uh, a good base to start. Uh, we were, the last few years, it's been funny cause it's like, we're three years into having our own factory now. And, uh, you know, it's hard when you have that because you hit, you know, you hit like November and people start thinking about snow and then we're pretty backed up with custom orders. And that's kind of like the whole thing that we're trying to do with winter stick right now is to be able to customize any board for anyone and fit it to your foot and all that. So, um, unfortunately like our own project boards kind of get pushed to the back burner once you get the revenue coming in, uh, right. late fall. So I'd had two days on the board before getting down there and, was just hoping I'd like it and uh, hadn't had much time to get wax through it yet. So, um, but yeah, we finally like, we were waiting, we'd ordered some new bases from this company in Germany back in like August and they showed up about December 20th. So we were uh, a little behind on getting race bases in. Right. Now explain, explain the difference between a race base and a regular base. Well, like this year, I mean, one of the big things that we've been doing for some of our volume during the year is making race boards for younger kids, like especially with having Carabasset Valley Academy right there. Um, okay. And so what we wanted to be able to do, like a lot of times, even, you know, the years that I was racing on Kessler's on the World Cup and for the Olympics and stuff, those guys are all pretty um, secretive about everything they're doing. And so <laughs> right. trying to figure out when a board is going to run well or when it's not going to run well was always a little bit of a mystery. Cause even like Hans or Kessler would never give us the info on like what temperatures these certain base materials should run in. Hmm. The, the thing that we're really trying to do, especially for the kids is like to have total transparency where we're like, okay, like Isosport makes this base, this one runs in this temperature range. You know, you've got basically like you've got your warm and your cold board, so you can order two race boards and then it'll help that next generation be more prepared with their racing that they know, you know, they can just look at the thermometer and be like, okay, that's the one I'm going to run today instead of like all the magic behind the scenes that Curtis Bach has done <laughs> for years and hours and hours of glide testing and all that. So, right. And then it was funny because I was like, well, Baker's always warm. So I like picked the warmer of the base materials we got in. And then it was like the coldest year at Baker in, I don't know, 15 oh. years or something. So I was, mine was like one degree under the temperature range of where it should be, but it, it seemed to run pretty good. So Interesting. So these things are made specifically for degrees. Are they made, are some of them made softer? Some of them made harder to actually absorb wax differently? Talk, talk yeah. About. Yeah. Basically like the way that the, uh, you know, the, the warmer bases are going to be a softer base. The harder bases are going to, or the colder bases are going to be a harder base to, you know, combat abrasion and all that. So. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. That's pretty interesting. So tell me a little bit about the training that you, you go through before Baker. What do you do to get ready for Baker and, and how do you kind of get your training to the point where you're, you're peaked out, you're, you're at your apex right before the bank saw him. Well, it's, it's a little different than what I used to do for Olympics and stuff. Sure. Um, this is my fourth winter of being up in Whistler. So for me, it's really just free riding as much as possible. And then uh, my wife and I took the family over to Japan for 20 days at the start of January. And so just getting mileage, you know, like I, I did a ton of split boarding, uh, ton of split boarding in January and that just kind of got my legs strong. And um, I did, I, you know, like I've been, I've been battling injuries for quite a while. And so like the last time I won it was 2013. And then that spring I broke my leg, blew my knee up in AK and then really hadn't been healthy um, for like these five years in between. Uh, and two and a half years ago at the end of the season, I went down to Vail to uh, Tom Hackett, the doctor for the U S team. And we did a stem cell surgery on my uh, patella tendon and my back leg. Mm. So, Went in, drilled a hole in my pelvis, took the bone marrow out. They spin it out in the centrifuge, put it back in. 
And basically like the last two and a half years, my back leg knee has been getting better. Um, like where I was just riding with a ton of tendonitis pain from, for like 14, 15, 16, and then like 17, 18 winters, it started getting better. And then, uh, this year when I first started getting on snow, it was like the first time I've been pain free in six years, basically. So for me, that just allowed me to like up the volume of riding and, and free riding more and, you know, being able to, yeah, like take more pounding on that leg again. And so it was really for me, like now, like being really prepared for Baker is just having had a ton of mileage in and riding a ton of vertical. Now, Seth, you, you have won, you know, a number of X games, world championships, you've won two gold medals. Uh, what is it? Why, why, why go to Baker? And what is that? Why is that as a snowboarder, you know, this kind of like, I guess, the tip top of things and why do you still want to keep going and, and trying to win it? Well, for me, Baker is the most important event in snowboarding, you know, it, like growing up as a kid and especially growing up in new England, like the idea of the place where Craig Kelly grew up riding and, you know, mm -hmm. guys like Jeff Fulton taught him how to ride and Dan Donnelly and Carter Turk and like the whole Mount Baker hardcore rank wit. Right. Um, that just seemed like something that was so surreal growing up on the East coast. Cause we had so little snowboard scene and, and seeing a place that had so much acceptance for the sport early on in the eighties. Um, hmm. And so for me, like, you know, going to the U S open when it was still at Stratton was always a really important yearly kind of pilgrimage. Like uh, the first time I got to go down was in 91 and like Craig was in that final. And so seeing guys like that ride live for the first time. Um, and then, you know, hearing about Baker back in the day, like from the early photos and then, you know, all the, the lore of it and everything. And then I got to go to Baker finally in 96 for the first time and, uh, was just kind of blown away. Like, you know, that was one of the years that Terry A won and, uh, just, seeing the level of free riding there and like that terrain, like I hadn't been any, you know, I'd been in Colorado for a couple of years going to college. And that was like my first year that I dropped out of college to just snowboard full time. And so it was a pretty formative experience of like, this is to me, it felt like that was where the epicenter of snowboarding was. And, and uh, that the simplicity of the event, because really like I was a full time half pipe rider at that point. Hmm. And the idea of like just having this natural gully with banks and, you know, the fact that, you know, I think especially for me the first time going that like Terrier crushed the field that year and, you know, that how influential he was in the freestyle movement at that point to like see him and to have heard the stories of Craig and like guys like Sean Palmer winning there. Like it was sure. definitely just seemed like the most important thing that you could do in snowboarding. And so, you know, I kick myself now that, there were so many years that I like prioritized world cups and other things. Like I, you know, like I've missed, you know, over half of the ones that happened since I went that first time in 96. And I'm just like, well, that was fucking stupid. Like, <laughs> why did I ever go do a fist event? Like when I could have been at Baker, like that was just retarded. So, um, so now, you know, it just like, especially getting older, like to be there and like, you know, get in a couple runs with Terrier or like just the whole crew of people that's there, like the vibe and the energy. And then like the next generation of guys that like, I really like watching like guys like Harry Carney and Curtis Sizzik and sure. all the drink water guys. And just the guys that are just living snowboarding, like, and I can kind of like look back at my own time and know that I was like way too caught up in the competitive aspects of the sport and I wish um I would have taken more time out to just enjoy riding or like spend time at places like that in the winter when things were good right so you've won two olympic gold medals you've won two rolls of golden duct tape uh which one is uh occupies the uh the center point on your mantle <laughs> <laughs> the duct tape the duct tape does. okay wow the olympic golds are just in a drawer <laughs> oh yeah yeah. <laughs> okay. So the duct tapes are, are almost more important really than the gold medals, maybe not financially, but at least as far as satisfaction snowboarding goes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, you know, for me, I, like the first, like the first two times I went back, like I went in 96 and then I didn't go again until 03. 
And I got second in 03 and again in 04 to Terrier both times. And for me, that felt more rewarding than anything else I'd done to that point in snowboarding. You know, it was like to be there and still be feeling like, you know, you're at that point where you're chasing after your heroes and stuff when you're a little younger that, um, yeah, that was like way more important to me to, to get those early duct tapes and then to, to come full circle. Yeah. And just to beat Terry A every year. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, now I got him six years running. So I'm feeling like <laughs> it's, it's getting better and better. Right. Well, okay. so, you know, you've most certainly dedicated much of your, like the last of your career to, uh, to racing. Is there ever this feeling like you roll into Baker and everyone's like, damn it, Seth's here. Uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I think it used to be worse. It's kind of like, you know, like I waxed Terrier's board for him the last couple of years. Mm. And I'm trying to like be like, hey, look, like, uh, let's make it all fair here and right. just have it be about the riding. But uh, but yeah, I, I think there is always that feeling a little bit. And like I, I always wanted to like be there on my free ride board and not be like bringing stuff over from the race world into there. And just, mm. you know. Sure. Do you get heat? Do you get less sweat from the other competitors now that you're riding a winter stick and not a Kessler? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But it's now, funny because, like, back in the day, you know, like, I forget what year it was. Maybe oh two, like Delarue went for the first time and won it, and like, you know, like even in those years, like we were on free ride boards, but they were all like when Delarue and I were both on Dina Star and Rosie together, like they were making us full race based things. So it's like, right. you know, sure. camouflaged. <laughs> <laughs> so now, do you get to like sweat people for riding Kesslers now that you're on a regular free ride? <laughs> right. I, I told, free I told ride Nate, board? I told Nate, I'd give him pro form if he wants to buy a real snowboard for next year. <laughs> <laughs> what did Nate ride this year? He was on a Kessler. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. He tried. The, he tried the flight on the uh, on Saturday. Oh, nice! I he saw was, it. He didn't do. I think as he well. was about six seconds off the pace, though. <laughs> right. Oh, so limited. He's so bummed right now. He was like, <laughs> no, I you know, just for the fact that he liked the board enough to try it out and and no, prove I, that the base isn't fast enough. <laughs> right. No, I, I think it's rad to see those come back. Like, you know, my first coach was Eric Webster and Flight was his first sponsor. And so it's like, I, I love everyone who's working to keep those brands that were part of the early history of snowboarding alive. Like, I mean, that's a passion project for me, for sure. And it's, I just think it's awesome. Yeah. People should know that those things were part of the history of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe we should make like a flight, uh, a flight winter stick collab. That would be pretty Absolutely. cool. Absolutely, we got our TJ one out there right now in Japan. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. So tell, tell me, last question about um, snowboard cross country. We have a lot of ground to cover still, but yeah. uh, tell, tell me, um, what does it take to be like a good snow or a good bank slalom racer? Like, what kind of things are you thinking about? uh you know is it like the the wax is important or is it just keeping your board on the ground and absorbing every bump what does it take to be a good racer well i mean i think for bank slalom it takes the ability to just be in the moment and be a little bit creative like you know the years of racing border cross you have a definite plan of what you're going to do and especially with the baker race like the course is changing so much through the day that you really just kind of have to drop in and be able to adapt. I mean, you're, for me, I, I you know, I've kind of, I'm hoping that this will be a pattern of like, I really believe that, you know, cause in 13, when I want it, then I was hurt for a bunch of years. I want it again, feeling healthy, but I really think it actually favors goofies a little bit at Baker. The sun is always on my heel side wall like where I'm doing my heel side turns. So you get a nice little tight pocket on that wall. And so I feel like keeping your flat base in that little pocket on most years, you can gain a lot of momentum because like you're able to run it really loose that way and gain your acceleration. And then when I come over my toe side wall is always icy. So then you can like cut that turn a little tighter um, and kind of not have to rely on the banks, but it's, you know, every run where you drop in there, it's like, well, it's been 24 hours and 850 more people have gone down this thing and there's no grooming or anything, you know, like they do a little bit of rake work when they get really bad holes or paint circles around rocks that come out or whatever. But, um, you, you'd have to be kind of in that 
free ride mode, like you would be in Alaska or something where you're just kind of like in the moment and adapting to what's going on around you and, and trying to let the board run as much as you can. Cool. So let's rewind the clock a little bit here to the beginning of your snowboard career. Cause I'm curious of like, how did you get into snowboarding and how did you become like a competitive snowboarder? Because I know you, you specialized in half pipe long before border cross or snowboard cross, I guess now. Yeah. Um, I got into snowboarding, um, in the sixth grade. Uh, it was, so I was 10, it was, uh, 1986. And these guys that I knew through skateboarding in my hometown, I grew up, uh, at the start of fifth grade, I moved, um, I got to see fewer notifications here. Um, God damn it. I grew up in a town called Farmington, which was a university town. And so from the time that I was pretty young, it was cool because you had a skateboard culture there because the college kids that were into skateboarding and where my house was, was in one of the four downtown blocks. The major parking lot for the town was like right behind my house. So there was a setup there, like the water department had another uh, parking lot off that one that had like, they let us leave ramps there and everything. And so for me, you know, skateboarding was how I'd spent all the months of the year in Maine that there wasn't snow on the ground. And then the older guys that I knew through skateboarding, like kids that were in high school already when I was, you know, in the middle, in the fifth and sixth grade, uh, we had a little local ski hill that only had like 400 vert on it. But uh, they let them come one night to do a demonstration. And I just followed these guys around the whole night. Like I was on skis. I'd only started skiing in the fourth grade. This was like, you know, two and a half years into alpine skiing. My parents weren't skiers. They both worked at, well, my mom worked at the university there and my dad worked at another one. And uh, so all these older guys that I knew through skateboarding came, I followed them around for the whole night. I had a paper route at the time. I tracked down one of them a day later and bought his Burton would be 145 off him. And after that demonstration, the guy this guy his name was charlie and he was probably about 70 years old at the time and he was like literally did the like over my dead body will they ever be riding snowboards here and and it took that like about eight years later he passed away and then that little ski hill started allowing snowboarding on it but for those eight years in between he was like oh they're gonna ride lunch trays next and all this you know all the shit that we heard back then. <laughs> right and so it was like a one night thing. And so I'd bought this board the next day. And so I just started hiking all the back hills around Farmington, which back then, like we used to have pretty decent snow and like Farmington was a pretty hilly area. So like there was a lot of places where you could get like two or 300 vertical woods runs or like there were these uh, really steep pitches that went down to these farm fields. And uh, so it was pretty rad. Like a few of us at the time, you know, we're just going out there and hiking back hill. And then the following year, so like that whole spring, that was probably like in February that I got the board that whole spring, I just hiked. And then, uh, the next year, Sugarloaf was about 40 miles up the road. And my mom took me up for like opening day of the season. Same guys that were like, you know, five, six years older than I was met me took me up like there was this one double chair that you could either like get off halfway or go all the way and they're like oh no no, no. we're gonna stay on go all the way up and so i'd never ridden on hard pack yet like i'd only ridden you know in relatively powder snow on a board with no edges and we get off the top of this double chair and there's this one pitch called kangaroo hill and the thing was just complete ice moguls like 500 vertical feet at a nice pitch of just ice death and uh about halfway down the run like i got spun around backwards slammed into a mogul so hard it like it peeled the base right off my woody and i like i come down to the lodge and i'm like literally crying because it was like you know like i go into the lodge my mom's there i'm like i, like, I broke my snowboard and like i knew it, like you know I'd, it was like a year of friggin doing my paper route to save up to get that burton woody which was <laughs> not good anyway so i'm like i you know like i was already like pricing myself under like well i can't afford an elite because that has edges and it's like too expensive <laughs> and uh so i broke the board that day like we took it to this ski shop that tried to repair it they kind of like rebased welded the base to it that lasted about three hours and then <laughs> um 
And so then I just kind of wrote on the thing for the rest of that year. But I, that was like prior to having a season's pass. So like the next year, you know, I ended up doing a bunch more like just backhilling with it and stuff, building jumps. And then the next year, like my buddy, uh, one of the older guys had, a, had started a skate shop in Farmington and he picked up selling barfoot. And so I'd like bike like six miles out to his shop every day and like stare at this barfoot twin tip and was just like in awe of this thing, you know? And at the time, like I weighed probably like 115 pounds. And so I bought a 161 that like, you know, you couldn't flex if you weighed 250 pounds. Like there was just no bend in it, but I got it. And like that next winter got my first season's pass at Sugarloaf and was like, thought that it was amazing having edges. And then, uh, yeah, things just kind of kept going from there. Right. It seems like all those early boards, no matter what you were on, the next board you got was like significantly better than the last one to the point you were like, wow, this is amazing. Oh yeah. But I remember that bar foot board without any flex. And that definitely yeah. was part of a snowboard that you would ride today. Let's say. <laughs> well, so, and it was because each year it just got progressively better. You know, it was like the next year I got a Sims half pipe and I can like, I can remember the first run on that and like actually feeling it bend like decamber and end into a turn and being like, Oh my God. And right. then uh, the year after that, I got the the purple Craig Kelly and that was just like game changing. And I, I rode that for a few years and then uh, got the air six one that brushy had like won his world title on yeah. from 91 and then snapped that and then went back to, then I like T-bolted out my old Craig Kelly, rode that for another year. And then that following year, I was at Bolton Valley in Vermont. And uh, I was like a J2 at the time in the half pipe. But I, I won like the whole event. Like I beat the J1s, beat the seniors, all that stuff. And Chris Copley picked me up. And then it was mm -hmm. Brushy's first pro model. The, the fish was like my first board that I got sponsored by for Burton. And that was like... Like I still, you know, like Chris being like, come down to the van after the event and like going down and just being like blown away to walk away with a snowboard and modern bindings. Cause like that first generation of like those old Burton air bindings that I'd been riding on the high backs would snap. And so like, I got to the point where I was buying uh, like these thick uh, plastic pots, like for mm. potting plants and make cutting my own high backs out of them. Cause it was always so cold in Maine. You'd like snap the old high backs. And so like, I got really good at building high backs out of these potted plant pots that uh, <laughs> That's I made like bolt back into the, the old, the original Burton airs and, uh, and make it through like a couple of weeks of riding before you'd snap those off again. Mm. <laughs> so what, what was your first contest? Was it a half pipe event or did you do racing or, or how did oh, you start? Yeah. Off? First First half pipe, uh, first event was a half pipe. It was actually, it was New England Cup at Sugarloaf. And uh, for me, that was like mind blowing because I'd go there a bit on my own, you know, but it was like seeing all these guys show up for it was like so surreal where all of a sudden there's like a snowboard scene going off at the half pipe. Usually it was like three of us hiking, which the old pipe at Sugarloaf came down and then had like a 45 and then another 45. And it was, you know, <laughs> just, it was a ditch. Like you're just building your own highway hits and everything. There was, you know, it was like ages before they tried using an excavator or anything like that. But right. yeah, that first new England cup. And then the next year, um, like I just did that one that year. And then the next year I started going over to New Hampshire, um, went over to black mountain early in the season for like a half pipe double header and started doing the white mountain series. And then like that next year was kind of when like, I couldn't afford to go to CBA, but Webb kind of like adopted me into the program where he'd drive the opposite way, like, and go, you know, 45 minutes out of his way to come down to Farmington and pick me up on the Friday night when they were going to green mountain series. And he just like mm -hmm. pretended I wasn't in the program. Like I'd made it like three years without having to pay the school anything. Cause Webb would just like, be like, oh, I'm just gonna drive the other way and pick this kid up that's going with us. And no way, yeah. And so that was huge. I mean, like Eric, you know, a lot of things. Like, you know, he finally he got me my scholarship to go to CBA my senior year. But like those few years of like him literally going out of his way every weekend, 
um, to come pick me up made all the difference for me to be able to compete early on. And that like he could convince my parents that, you know, like my parents divorced when I was 12. So there was a little bit of like freedom because they were kind of like both in their careers and doing their own thing. And I could skip a lot of school mm. to go snowboarding because like the weeks that I was at my dad, he, dad's he had an hour commute in the opposite direction to the college that he worked at and like his programs wouldn't get done till five he wouldn't get done till six so like the weeks that I was staying with him I could kind of like you know like I'd walk right past the bus stop and go to my buddy's house who was like my first weekend program coach who was in the college at that point and he'd usually be hung over so I'd just like go into his apartment take a nap for an hour or two and then we'd drive up to Sugarloaf ride all day come back and uh, I, I basically, like when I got into high school, made a deal with my principal because I'd gone to nationals for the first time, that first nationals at Vail's, at Vail. And uh, I was like, look, you know, they won't let me snowboard on the local hill here. Sugarloaf's the only place I can do it. I'm competing on the weekends. And he, and my sister, thank God, had been like a super good student because I was not, but she'd kind of paved the way for me three years earlier. And so he like gave me the benefit of the doubt where he was like, okay, like, you know, like I know what's going on with your family and all this. And we'll just like, as long as you're passing everything, we won't put your attendance on your report card. And so <laughs> like my sophomore and junior years, I was skipping like 40, 45 days a year. I'd have, I'd have to have perfect attendance, like right up until like, you know, the start of winter, like December 1st, then I'd have to have perfect attendance in the spring. Mm. But basically this guy, Tom Ward, who was our principal, like saw that I was super passionate about snowboarding, knew that there was no outlet for there for me. Mm. And he kind of like let me run wild with it. And uh, it was awesome. Okay. So Tom Ward, Eric Webster, two key yep. uh, mentors. Any other mentors in your early days of snowboarding that are worth mention? Um, well, I mean, like in our little Sugarloaf circle, the guy, Tony Laurentano, who is our weekend program coach. Um, he rode for Burton for a tiny bit early on, but he was kind of like, he was the one who owned the, the snowboard shop, which was called the shred shed in Farmington and that I bought the barfoot from. And, um, and he, you know, being older, like he was the one who had a driver's license and was the one who was able to get me up to Sugarloaf. Um, and then, you know, there was really a family too, like the Warren family who, um, Johnny Warren and I met. So I moved to Farmington at the first day of fifth grade and he and I, A, were in the end of the alphabet homeroom. And, uh, but he was the only other kid who showed up to school on the first day of fifth grade with a skateboard. And so you're instantly like, okay, like you're my friend. And, uh, and his dad was a history professor at the college as well. Um, but was super into skiing and had like got, you know, been going into Tuckerman's and stuff like that since the sixties the and all that. And so, when my folks divorced, his dad kind of like adopted me into the family on weekends. Like at the start of seventh grade, they bought a condo up at Sugarloaf and basically like Friday nights through Sunday nights, I'd be with the Warren family. Cool. And that was, that was huge for me. Like, and his dad would, you know, he'd take us out of school in the spring to go do Tuckerman's trips and, and things like that. So that was, uh, that was definitely influential. And, and especially like, you know, to go to Tuckerman's at a young age and with, relatively crappy snowboard equipment like you learn to ride steeps right away so that was uh you know i've always felt like looking back like going to ak all those years later and getting to do free riding stuff all around the world that those early tuckerman's trips were so influential for me of wanting to go and ride steep stuff right on right on so um you know you you kind of uh, are known for snowboard cross, but really you were like a successful half pipe competitor before that. Tell me a little bit about your half pipe career and then how you got into snowboard cross border cross was probably called at the time. How did that happen? Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like growing up, like we were in a unique time of growing up in the East coast and having guys like brushy and Ford and Richards and Noah Brandon come out of the East coast like that me was what I was trying to emulate with my snowboarding and, you know, being a little younger than them, but like getting to see them ride in person sometimes. And then like through, you know, they were so huge in the magazines and stuff at that point that, yeah, I, I mean, I just coming from a skateboard background, I just wanted to be a freestyler. And, uh, for me, you know, Ross Powers and I grew up 
together competing. Like we're, I'm a little bit older than he is, but we were kind of, you know, our generation of the white mountain series and green mountain series. Like we traded off a lot of the half pipe wins when we were young. And then, you know, a couple years later, it was kind of like when Petraska and Teeter and those guys started coming in. Um, but yeah, like the early, the early days, all I wanted to do is be a pipe writer. Unfortunately, both of my parents worked at colleges because um, I <laughs> wanted to just immediately go out and start doing stuff when I graduated high school in 94. And I got forced into college for about a year and a half. I did three semesters, but my remedy to that was going to Western State Colorado um, because I, it gave me access to the mountains. Um, you know, in those days, like, you know, it was so different where it was like, yeah, I had a landline in my room, but it wasn't like my parents had any concept of like how much I was going to school versus how much I was snowboarding. You know, there was no connectivity back then. And so for me, like it was an opportunity to get wet and then, yeah, just go wherever. And uh, so I, I kind of like, that year, like the spring of my freshman year, like as soon as I went to college, Burton dropped me. They were like, oh, well, you're not going to focus on snowboarding anymore. Hmm. So I had a buddy who had moved from Maine uh, out to Hood River, and he was involved with starting this little snowboard company called Spry. And so I was on Spry for a couple years, and they basically, you know, when I was a freshman in college, started giving me like 250 bucks a month, something like that, and boards. And then the Colorado border, which was the shop in Crested Butte, uh, the guys that owned it, Seth Wiener and Alex Overcash, um, they kind of took me in right away and gave me a little bit of a travel budget and stuff. So I, I rode Greyhound all over the <laughs> West Coast of the United States because I couldn't afford a car. Um, you know, no. just like planes were way too expensive. So it would be like, you know, three days on the bus from Gunnison up to Hood River and you know, we'd go ride at Meadows or like that. But that spring of my freshman year, I got to do like a film project with Rod Parmenter, who was out of Hood River. And so, you know, like did some trips, like came up to Whistler for the first time, like got to go film on the Black Home Windlip and on the old quarter pipe and in the park back then, which was like kind of just getting going. And then uh, that same spring was kind of like the first uh, version of, you know, pre super park but like snowboarder magazine did a mammoth house mm. and i was i was riding for twist at the time too so i got to go down and shoot with justin hosnick and that was like my first time of going into the backcountry and like building quarter pipe kickers and stuff like that outside of mammoth and and getting to like spend that whole spring kind of like working on shooting and filming and stuff and i i loved it it was rad but i also just kind of knew like for me it was like I'd come home to Maine and the East coast and be a dish dog all summer at the restaurants. And like, you just couldn't like save enough money. Like I couldn't save enough money to like buy a car that was going to be able to get me around the West coast. And I just, mm. there wasn't any financial support for my family. Mm. Um, so I just like, I decided that competing was kind of the way to go. So I dropped out after that second fall of college and we had a pretty good crew of kids who wanted to come back to CBA and do a post-grad year. Um, Paul Chapman was from Canada. He ended up being like the overall junior world champion that year. And um, like a few kids that were more focused on the Alpine racing because of like the history of Fawcett and Jones being there. Um, so Paul and I were kind of the two freestylers, but then, you know, we crossed over into some of the Alpine stuff too, just because Webb still made us do that at that point. Um, but that first event, like I dropped out at Christmas time, the first event was a AST event in Vail and I went and got third behind Brushy and Richards in the half pipe. And that basically like I took that prize money check, had to go open a bank account in Vail because they wouldn't like let you cash anything. And I didn't have a credit card or anything like that at that time. You know, I was literally like going around with like the cash in my pocket. And so <laughs> I like went into the bank and like told them about, you know, like made up this story, how I'd like just moved to Colorado and I needed to start a bank account and, but they would only let me take like 75% of the prize money check. But anyway, I like bought my bus ticket to Kirkwood for the next weekend and then just kind of had a good role on the pro tour that year and ended up, I don't know, I think like third or fourth overall for pipe for that season. And 
spry in the midst of that ended up folding and Burton took me back on. And then the next year I got like my first small travel budget from Burton. Mm. Um, and that was, you know, right about the time where they made the decision that half pipe and Alpine were going to be in for Nagano. Mm. And it just worked out somehow that, you know, Sugarloaf was so into doing competitive stuff that like the following year when the Grand Prix started, the first Grand Prix that ever happened was at Sugarloaf. And then the next year that the first Olympic qualifier that ever happened was at Sugarloaf. And so I was, you know, just kind of fell into that, that I was fortunate enough that those early half pipe contests and that Sugarloaf was, you know, they bought one of the first pipe dragons and they kind of had it in my backyard. And I was fortunate, mm -hmm. you know, that I had grown up just down the road and Right. You know, I had connections to be able to get like super cheap rent so I could get a, keep a place going, but then be gone all winter. And, and so, yeah, I mean, really from 96 through, uh, like say just after world championships in 03, that was like half pipe was my focus. And I was, you know, I ended up doing border cross for the first time cause I was at X games for half pipe and, uh, it was the second year ever of X games. It was the first year that it was in Crested Butte and they were kind of like, yeah, there's an open spot in the field if you want to jump in. And, uh, so yeah, I ended up, I did, you know, I think I was fourth in pipe that year at X games. And then I ended up making the podium behind Palmer and Jason Brown and border cross. And then I was kind of like, well, that helps. Cause you know, like I earned some prize money and it helps me keep traveling. So, um, I just kind of started doing the border crosses on Sunday after I do the pipes on Saturday. Right. Hey, um, so you said Webb, Webb made you race Alpine back in the day, huh? Yeah. Did, yeah. Did those skills learn, you know, you, you probably had to put on the hard boots and put on the, you know, and did those skills kind of transfer over once you made it to border cross or did it help you in the half pipe in those early years? Do you think? Oh, I, I think it helped in both. Yeah. I mean, I like, you know, it, for me, it was really cool when I was young to have a guy like Mark Fawcett and a guy like Jeremy Jones at Sugarloaf because I grew up getting to see how to properly make a turn, you know, mm -hmm. and those guys, you know, like I didn't know them at the time, but like I knew who they were and, you know, you'd see him riding like when I was on the chairlift, you'd see him come under you or whatever and you'd be like, man, I, I need to like that's, that's pretty much like the standard of how I need to turn. Um, so Jeremy and Mark were huge influences on me early on. And then, you know, Webb had left the world cup to come coach them. And Webb was an amazing source of info early on. And he taught us a lot of the techniques that like, you know, it's all subconscious for me now, but it's like a lot of like, sinking onto the edge and staying low and all these, all these things that like I would be able to look at my run at Baker this last weekend and be like, well, that's Mark and Jeremy and Webb's influence on my early, mm -hmm. early riding. And, right. and, I, and I do think, especially in half pipe, you know, cause Ross used to race with us every weekend too. Like we'd all put on the hard boots back then. And especially that first generation of like the pipe dragon pipes where the trannies were so tight and mm. you know, you're staying locked into that edge to be able to rotate or whatever it, uh, yeah, the, those carving skills from the Alpine definitely translated over and they, and they helped, um, you know, they helped make, make me a more well-rounded snowboarder. Mm. Yeah. It seems, so, like uh, a lot of, it seems like a lot of people overlook that influence of, uh, carving and, and hard boots, et cetera, on half pipe and style disciplines when really those are some of the fundamental skills you use across all snowboarding. Yeah. I mean, now with the 22 footers, like you see, and we've watched this, you know, evolution of it with the half pipe where they set an edge differently than you used to have to, you know, like now the line is way more down the pipe in between the hits yep. to maintain the speed because the pipes are so damn big. But back in the day, like, yeah, you had to carve up that thing, especially on your straight airs um, because they're just like, you know, there wasn't enough wall to hold you in when you were going big. So it wasn't, um, it was a different shape. Like the way that you attacked the pipe was a different arc, you know, than, than it is now. And especially on those kind of tight transitions, it was like a tighter side cut radius. All those things made a difference as to like, 
how you were able to control your errors. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people wouldn't know how many days Ross Powers put in in hard boots prior to that method in Salt Lake, but you know, those of us that all grew up riding together on the weekends and racing those slalom and GSs, we know that that stuff all helped us. Yeah. So, so how did you come about like specializing in snowboard cross, kind of going away from half pipe and really just focusing in on the border cross snowboard cross discipline? Because I would say that you were really, you know, one of the first people to specialize in, in one of the disciplines. Yeah. Um, I mean, the moment for me was like, it was in a press conference at a uh, world championships in 2003 in Kreisberg, Austria. Uh, I'd made the pipe finals two nights before, like Stephen Fisher and I were the only two Americans to make the pipe final that night. And I ended up ninth and I just didn't have the technical tricks, like as it was getting to 1080s and beyond. And I think like, you know, for me being 6'2 and 200 pounds, it was really hard for me to do much beyond a nine. Um, like I just didn't, you know, I didn't have those kind of gymnastic skills. And so it was being really honest with myself that, you know, like here it is, like this is kind of like the level I can ride to and I can be like a top 10 person in this event at that moment. Or, you know, the, the next day, like at world champs, it was Delarue one. I was second. Drew Nielsen was third in border cross. And we were in the, the press conference and the Austrian media asked us, you know, what do you think about snowboard cross being in the Torino Olympics? And none of us had heard that yet, but we kind of all looked at each other and we were like, well, sweet, like this is what we're good at. So if it's in the Olympics, like it's going to make making a living a little easier. So, um, you know, I did one more, I kept riding pipe through that world cup season in 04, but I, you know, I, I knew like you're watching Sean White come into things and it's just like, it's got, always going to go, the sport's always going to go to a whole other level. And as much as I liked the freestyle aspect of it, I just knew that like I couldn't spin and flip that fast um, as these kids were doing. And so it was kind of a natural transition. And then that same spring, that April of 03 was the first time I ever went up to Alaska. Um, Uli Kestenholtz brought me up there to work on a project, uh, like Mitch Tolder, Flo Orley, Xavier Delarue um, were up there for two weeks before. Mm. And then Uli and I went up to work for another two weeks with this Austrian filmer, Seppi Dobringer, to do a little movie with them. And that, and that was like, I was living in Europe pretty much at that point. Like I had a girlfriend in Switzerland who was on the Swiss national team. And so from like that year, like 03 through 06, I basically lived in Switzerland in Thun. And Uli had become my free riding partner. And so he, he'd been up to do King of the Hill and stuff like that back in the day. And he was like, come on, we, you know, we got to go to AK this spring. And so we went up and it, and it was just kind of, for me, it was like a whole natural evolution of getting out of the half pipe, committing to this other discipline, and then really like starting to put time into free riding every year, because that was kind of what I had always been waiting for. You know, it was like, Craig, Craig's model of like be successful at competing and Terrier's model too, be successful at competing and then get the opportunity to go into the big mountains was what I had always wanted to do. And so that, that same season, kind of those three pieces of the puzzle sort of all came together. And, uh, and that was kind of the start of the transition for me. Okay. So you were already free riding <laughs> prior to actually specializing in, uh, in snowboard cross. So you already had that kind of as like a, a goal beyond competition. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you know, the end of the ISF days, like the ISF time was amazing because like just a, it was snowboarders running snowboarding, but also, um, you know, the energy was different. Like they were supportive of, of the riders, like the top 48 were paid every week. Like, so like that O2 season before the ISF died, like that whole year in Europe of like doing pipe events, doing border cross events, it just felt like the snowboarding community was so much tighter. And then that O3 year, like with the ISF dying and fist taking control fully and then saying, you know, well, we're going to add your other discipline to the Olympics. It, it was a tough thing because, um, you know, you just kind of felt that, 
death of it in a way of like, well, fuck now, like the skiers run everything. And like the community part of it seemed to dry up because all of a sudden it became about being, you had to be a part of a national team to get into these events Mm. versus it just being a group of snowboarders being there to compete. And like that finals in locks, the spring before, like the last locks finals, you know, like the freestylers would do border cross, Alpine guys would do border cross. It just seemed like the sport kind of like was all more interconnected with itself. And, um, and so that, like, that was another part of like, you know, it was like deciding to focus on it because it was like, you know, for me, like, I kind of always felt like, okay, like I'm a journeyman snowboarder. Like I can either become a carpenter or I can try to make a living out of snowboarding. And so that was as much as I hated the fist and hated to like take that step. It was either that or like, you know, like, yeah, you're going to be pounding nails for the rest of your life in Western Maine. And so, um, so it was like, I wanted to take that opportunity because I wanted to keep snowboarding, but you know, there, it was such a transition time in the sport, like losing the ISF at the end of 02 was just such a huge blow. Right. Did it feel like a betrayal? The first FIS you showed up for in 03 after the season or multiple seasons of ISF competitions? Yeah, for sure. And it just like, it, it just had no life to it. It felt so weird, you know, like, and you know, that's why, like, I kick myself now. It's like, what was I thinking not going to Baker every one of those years? Because you're just like, I, I got, you know, like you get into a point where it's like with the national team, you're like, okay, like this is how I'm getting my health insurance. Like at the time, like in those early years of the U S team, like we actually used to get like a per diem to be on the road. So it was like, you were definitely doing it as a way to make a living and to be able to like do other parts of snowboarding. And I was, I was trying to capitalize on that. So that it was like, I could save enough every year to have a heli budget for AK um, and to make sponsors happy. Cause there was still, you know, there was still some pretty good money in it in those years. Like the, when I first got off Burton and went to uh, atomic, they gave me like an uncapped TV incentive and that was like how I went to Alaska for the first time. Cause it was ridiculous. Cause all those races were on Eurosport and you're just adding like $40 a second that you're on the TV <laughs> doing these things. So like by the spring, when you're like sitting there on your couch with the VHS tapes and like clicking your stopwatch and being like, Oh my God, like I just made enough to go snowboard in Alaska for quite a while. There was a part of that, that, you know, felt like a betrayal in some ways to snowboarding but it was like well this is how I'm making a living now so I'm gonna I'm gonna do as much of this as I can but it was yeah I mean it, it when the ISF went under it just it sucked let me ask you I think we uh you know all of us who grew up here out in Sun Valley we we trained different disciplines we did border cross we raced we did half pipe um but uh you know border cross kind of started fading away in the in the eyes of like the teams they stopped going out and setting gates and training gates to, you know, afford for some of the kids who wanted to do border cross. And then those kids didn't come back the next year. Um, talk to me just about kind of like in your eyes, why didn't border cross stay in the forefront of some of those teams or some of those riders? Or why wasn't that important to some people? And it kind of, in my perception of it kind of whittled it down to just these certain, the certain group that could actually do it, make it to the races. And actually yeah. Well, I mean, I think part of that goes back to like the ISF dying, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was like the number of riders that we had who were like multidiscipline in those years of the ISF and the Swatch events was so much bigger. And then, you know, a lot of the Europeans who'd had a longer period of time of being within that system of the ISF were just like, yeah, fuck this. I'm not going to go do those events. Gotcha. And I think, I think that was a big part of it dying you know it was like for me the olympics were definitely a carrot because it was like well i can potentially change my life by doing something there on that day and so i was willing to do it but you know like i have a lot of old friends from europe who just like were like nope i'm gonna become a cat driver at meyerhofen this year i'm gonna do this or they just made life changes when the isf died because they were like there's no way and you know like I've always respected Terrier's decision on Nagano, mm. but 
there would like that's why I like say the journeyman part because it's like there's also like those of us that didn't have the sponsor dollars where we could be like oh well I'm just gonna do this other part of snowboarding it was like well unfortunately for me competitive snowboarding was how I was making my living and so that was kind of the only route it was like either you know become a snowboard coach somewhere or keep doing it professionally because I got to go this route and uh Right. And I, you know, like I, I had, I would go into the riders meetings and have fights with Ted Martin. And, you know, like I was, hmm. I, it was really weird because like the whole national team structure, like these other nations, like the athletes would be getting paid by their nation. The coaches would be getting paid by their nation. And so they just like would go along with whatever the fist was saying. And like, I would speak out a lot. Like I would, I was definitely a pain in Ted's ass for a lot of years. And then we had this funny like moment where uh, in 06 or like in the fall of 05, we were going to shoot a visa commercial up at Valley Nevada and we'd just gotten done with the world cup. And, and uh, you know, I'd been, you know, basically like the last two seasons just, going into the riders meetings every week and being like, well, this is bullshit. Like, this is dangerous. You're not thinking about this. And like trying to bring up all these concerns that would actually be looking out for the rest of the riders. And mm -hmm. Visa had hired Ted to be like an on-site coordinator. And I didn't know this. So like I get a call at my hotel room in the morning down in Santiago mm -hmm. And it's Ted on the phone. He's like, yeah, like, uh, yeah, I'm driving with you up to Valley Nevada. And I was like, oh, crap. Like, <laughs> here's, here's like the last two years coming back to me. And, um, and it was funny because he was like, look, I always thought you had valid points. I was just working for the Federation and there wasn't much I could say. And our whole kind of relationship changed on that car ride. And I got it gained a much deeper you know, respect for his position and, and where he was coming from. And I, I got it, but it was like, it was a funny day of like going back up there. Like, you know, we'd finished the world cup partied in Valley Nevada, come back down to the Santiago, the rest of the team left. And then Lindsay Jacob Ellis and I went back up there and, and Ted was giving us the ride. And I was just like, Oh man, two hours in the car with Ted's going to be hard. But it was actually funny. Cause we've, you know, kind of been friends ever since that, you know, I could finally like see his side of things that he was like, well, I'm just, have a job too and i'm trying to provide for my family so right so what are the cross. chances of uh getting rank with in a car with ted for two hours <laughs> i think that would be a little harder <laughs> yeah um i wanted That's to ask an episode for you guys though yeah. <laughs> border cross border cross is a lot of fun i think everybody every snowboarder knows this and i was you know sad over the years to to kind of see events not really happening um, do you feel like border cross kind of like within the broader scope of snowboarding started kind of being rejected as being a cool thing because it became too kind of like structured by the FIS and all that stuff? Do you feel like it kind of got, became the redheaded stepchild to snowboarding? Talk to me about yeah, I, I think it did in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, when Burton dropped it from the open, that was another dagger for it because they kind of kept it going a little longer. Um, you know, like we had some really like, what the final Nippon open where they did it was an amazing freestyle course. Like you were basically in the air more than you were on the ground. And like, mm. and same with a couple of those last U S opens, um, they were just pretty phenomenal, but yeah, I mean, then, you know, you lot, you started losing, you know, like when Palmer first stepped back from it and, you know, like you started having guys that had just been amazing snowboarders, like guys like Andy Hetzel, you know, like, mm people like that that would show up a couple times a year and then once they kind of stopped doing that i feel like the industry pulled back from it a bit because huh. um you know it just wasn't being represented by as many of the talents that were out there in snowboarding sure. right it seems like also that people with hard boots at least until well at least through 06 anyway were able to do decently in the sport and then the the tracks as well were different where I would say there was, there was usually like what I would call sucker jumps in the tracks where they would be like, you have to, you'd be flying out of a corner and then have to hit the brakes hard mm -hmm. in order not to just get tossed off. Oh, of yeah. jump. Talk about the development of, of the, the design and the, the tracks and then how kind of hard booting got pretty much eliminated from snowboard cross. Well, yeah, the, 
the tracks were at such a high level in the ISF days. And that was a big problem with the FIS is that like they wouldn't put the resources into enough snowmaking, enough cat time to actually build quality courses. And, you know, the, the big thing that I was really bummed about was like the final race we ever had at LOX in 02, um, the ISF instituted mandatory freestyle. And I thought that that was the direction that the sport needed to go. And I think that would have changed everything. Like there were two shortcuts in that finals course and the shortcuts were about a half a second faster, but you had to either spin or flip the tables um, to be able, like you'd be disqualified if you didn't spin or flip. Right. <laughs> and so I was like, this is amazing. You know, like the, like the final with all of us, it was like Delarue, Nielsen, myself, Marku Hauser, like the, the whole tour, uh, I think it was Philippe Kant as well. It could have been Nico Kant though, but like the whole tour that year came down to the final heat. There were three of us that could have won the overall and like, we're all in there spinning or flipping over these tables together in this final race. And I was like, this is where the direction of where this should go. Mm. And then again, unfortunately that was the last ISF race that ever happened. But you know, for the years that X games kept it alive, I feel like that was still a marquee and a premier event. And like having the finish kicker at Aspen being bigger than the big air jump, um, you know, like the other riders would, you know, you'd see him in the tent. They'd be like, Jesus, man, like you're really sending it off that. And, uh, and that was, I think that was what the sport would have needed. Like you had to have it at a high enough level that, people from the other disciplines could look over and be like, yeah, that's pretty badass." Um, and unfortunately the fist just wasn't creating that. And so, yeah, like the, the hard booters hung in there, um, through Oh six. And then, uh, yeah, thank God. Like I got around Radoslav in that final in Torino. Cause I feel like Europe would have just had this explosion of hard boot kids from Eastern Europe coming into border cross. But, right. uh, you know, it was, that was a mission of, you know, myself, of Delarue, of Drew Nielsen, like we really felt strongly that we're like, no, this is a freestyle discipline and it's a free ride discipline. And like, we would, I mean, we, even though we were on different teams, we'd like talk to each other in races and like set hard booters up for passes and stuff to like be sure that we were creating like in those 03, 04, 05, 06 years, like we, we were adamant about like, we did not want someone who came from the fist side of things winning races. And we'd literally like talk to each other and in the middle of heats and like try to make sure that it was still going to be like a podium of ISF riders in those early years. Mm -hmm. And like, that was something that, yeah, we were just like, this has to be a free ride thing. And it has to be a freestyle thing. And because otherwise like it was totally going to be dead. Mm. Right. A little bit of collusion ended up yeah. helping snowboard cross. Yeah. International collusion. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. So, so take us through that day when you won that first gold medal on in Torino, Italy. Um, that was a pretty radical course. Take us through that course in that day. Yeah. Um, that Jeff I Haxie, um, who's out, he's from up here in Whistler area. Um, he built that one. Um, I really liked Jeff's courses. Like he had built the world championships the year before at Blackcomb where I had won and I'd, I'd had good success on his racetracks. Um, there was still one of those jumps in the course that you had to hit the brakes for, um, kind of right before the final turn. But, uh, for the right. most part, you know, like I always felt like in my career, I raced best when you could be trying to gain speed the whole way down. You know, I mean, just like free riding, like where it's like, you don't want to shut it down. Like you want to be gaining speed and creating momentum and feeling flow. And, um, and that course for the most part was like that, like you could pretty well hammer through it. And it was probably to that point, like the best turns we'd ever seen built. Um, I think he did like a 32 day build on that course, something like that. Ridiculous. And, uh, and so it was funny because, you know, we'd kind of determined early on, like through video review and stuff in the practice sessions that you could give up some ground, um, but keep momentum going for later in the race. And so there was, you know, these, there was one, 
it was a toe side turn that I just kind of like let Radoslav go, but I knew that I was going to be gaining momentum for further down the, further down the course. And well, well, the whole day was crazy. Cause like we, you know, it was like the first time it was going to be on that kind of a, a stage and, um, you know, like we'd watched half pipe go down, um, a couple days before, which had been amazing. And like, I, I had driven out and gone to see men's half pipe in Salt Lake. So like I'd been there for that and kind of had that idea of what the feeling of like that much energy in a space was going to be like around snowboarding, because other than the U S open, like we just didn't have days where you'd ever ride in front of that many people. And that's like a whole other component. And I think that energy is amazing and something that you can definitely feed off of. Um, but yeah, like we'd had a perfect stretch of weather. We woke up that morning and it snowed some like heavy, wet snow. The course was super slowed down. Kind of like all our wax testing basically was like thrown out the window. And, uh, the time trial was crazy. It was like puking these huge flakes. It was super slow, but, I, I, I like I was third in time trial. I think I can't remember if Delarue won it or if he was second and Marco Hooser won it. I think Marco might have won time trial and then and then Zob and then me. So like I knew things were in a good place. And then the thing that really like blew me away was as the day went, like I was fully expecting to like race Drew and Zob in the final. And then we like get through to the final and there's, you know, Delarue's younger brother with Paul Henry was in there, which was rad. But then like, you know, Jordy Font and um, Radoslav Zedek, it's like you got two hard booters. I don't think either of them had ever made a final before. Um, so I think like I, I got a little overconfident for sure. Like I'd won my three other hole shots that day, but I was kind of like, oh, well, it's me and Paulo, like this will be easy. And, uh, and it wasn't like those, I, you know, being on the other side of the brackets, I just hadn't seen those guys ride all day. And, and, uh, yeah, um, came out of the start gate was basically second into turn one and then just was trying to be patient because I knew, um, that lower down, I could set up this combo of turns where I, like knowing Radoslav and knowing like he's always going to carve the inside line on something and he's going to take the shortest route to everything, but it's going to kill his momentum over time. And so I just tried to be really patient and like, yeah, there was this one really long left-hand turn where you could go super high line in this berm and just create a bunch of speed. And that was, you know, what ended up setting up the pass for me. And then, you know, I was able to just barely hold on to the finish line. I think his boards were running, exceptionally well that day but uh yeah it was a surreal moment to like you know cross that finish line and and yeah like just hear the crowd and like yeah it was just bizarre what was it what was it like go ahead B. what was it like standing on top of that podium for you for all that work all those years and you know and standing on the on the podium for the first time with a real olympic medal around your around your neck it was awesome. It was, uh, like that whole afternoon was pretty crazy. You know, like we basically like did the flower ceremony, went straight into drug testing, had maybe like an hour press conference. And then they loaded us up in, uh, in these Alfa Romeos and like ripped us down because it was a couple of, you know, it was like an hour and a half drive to get down into the city of the Torino to the metals Plaza. And, uh, we had these like probably say 20, police motorcycles per car they were just like zipping along and shutting down roads and no way and they were just like hauling ass the whole way down to the thing and then uh yeah it was it was really cool like you know zob got to ride down in the car with paul henry and so that you know like the three of us were hanging out backstage before going out for the medal ceremony and you know, I think for Zob, it was a big transition moment of like seeing his younger brother do something um, because, you know, he had just been so dominant through those, the end of the ISF times and those years, like, you know, he'd won the overall title a few times and I mm. played off the world champion title. And uh, it was just a really cool moment, like for the three of us to be back there, we were all riding for the same snowboard company at the moment. Like we'd been spending a bunch of time together in France and like that just the energy backstage was really amazing and then 
you know, and then they bring you out on the stage and it was crazy the way that they orchestrate all that stuff where it was like, you know, they'd brought the rest of my family. They'd brought all the other U S team guys, our doctor, like the wax techs, everyone. So like when we went out, like the whole front row of the medals ceremony plaza was like all my people. <laughs> and, uh, awesome. that, that was probably like the most emotional part of it, you know, where you're like, super grateful for all the the help that you had because it's like even though you're out there doing the riding all the time you can't like you can't do it without everyone else and so um it was really surreal and then they had this cool little it was like a little catwalk that went up and over this stone wall um so there's like you know thousands of people in the metals plaza you get done with the star spangled banner and walk off the stage over this thing and there was like about a 200 by 300 yard stone plaza that was just completely empty except for the three of us hmm. and it was so surreal because the whole day had just been so hectic and all of a sudden you could like walk out into this space in italy and it was all like lit up with these blue lights and then fireworks started going off like over the wall next to it and just kind of like take your first breath of like oh like wow that was a crazy day and hmm. uh and just, yeah, like feeling. Right. So, so how did winning that medal, I mean, everyone has this perception that winning an Olympic medal is going to change your life. How did winning your first Olympic medal change your life? Um, well, it just, you know, it created a lot of opportunities for me. I mean, it, it's, it's exhausting after that, like that process, you know, I, I think I probably rode, I don't know not many days between then and Alaska that spring. Um, and then like when I got up to Alaska in April, it was kind of like you could decompress and like start snowboarding again for the first time. But it, it was such a whirlwind that year. And just like, you don't sleep, you're being dragged in all these directions that um, have nothing to do with your snowboarding. Um, and it was, yeah, it was just a, that, that first one was crazy. Like I wasn't prepared for that experience of like losing out on your snowboard time because that was always like the most important thing to me in the year and then uh the first day that i went to race again um i'd shown up late we had a world cup you know like a month later in lake placid and i showed up late because i was doing some stuff down in manhattan and uh the first run i took down the course i pulled up in the start gate and, um, yeah, like when I was just kind of like looking around for like who I could follow and, uh, Thomas Johansson, um, from Sweden was there and I dropped in right behind him and about halfway down the course, uh, he overshot a jump and hit so hard on his chest that he, uh, he passed away mm. and, uh, and you were directly behind him. I was directly behind him. Like I saw him take off, like compressed off this table and I like hit the brakes and stopped on the takeoff, saw him hit. And then like sat there the whole time, like while ski patrol came down, loaded him up, um, tried for a while to do CPR. And then I saw them like give up. Um, and then a patroller got like, basically on top of him on the sled on the way down and like started trying to get his heartbeat going again. But that was a, like, that was my first run back after like I hadn't done a run in a course since the Olympic run. And that was like a month later, they're like, Oh, well, welcome back to border cross. And, uh, it was crazy. And like everyone else, like I turned around, I walked up to the top of the course and was basically like, yep, it's canceled like this isn't happening. And I remember going into the tent and Nate was there and he was kind of like, what do you mean? We're racing today. And I was like, no, like no one's fucking racing today. Like it's today is done. And, uh, and so I just kind of like pulled the plug on the year at that point. Like I, I drove back to Maine and everyone else like went on to Japan to race again the next week. And I, I was just kind of like stepped away from it for a little while. And, um, and yeah, it was, just bizarre. Um, like, and actually at the very end of my drive, I was like 10 minutes from, uh, from my house in Maine, I ended up hitting and killing a deer that night too. So it was like, Oh, super weird, surreal day. And, uh, yeah, I, that was kind of like, 
that was it for that year. I was like, okay, I need to get away from this for a little while. Um, but it was, you know, it opened up opportunities for me to make a living. Um, it, it created all these opportunities, but the, I think the biggest thing and the hardest thing for me was like the loss of anonymity and especially in a state like Maine, because it's such a small state, like things just got really bizarre for me where you like, you'd be gassing up your car at an Irving's gas station and someone's like, you yeah. know, waving at you or whatever. And it was like, it, like it just really was bizarre because like, to me, like living in Carabasa Valley where we have like 700 year round residents, it's like, those are the people that I know. And outside of that, um, you know, I was always a bit of an introvert. And so like, I had to go through a process of like learning how to be out there and, uh, and be open to like, you know, people just coming at you from every direction all the time. And that was a huge learning process for me. Yeah. It's like, you can't even haul your own lobster pots anymore. Exactly. <laughs> so so uh, nope. just out of curiosity, do you have a main accent? Did you ever have a main accent? No, but uh, my, you should have heard my grandmother. Um, oh, yeah. what, what does the main accent sound like just for our listeners? Well, Christ, Bob, you got to, uh, you know, it depends if you're from down east or up in the northwest, but uh, <laughs> the main accent can be pretty thick. And uh, <laughs> my, my family goes back about six or seven generations since they started giving away the land for famine. So <laughs> uh, that's perfect. All right. So let's get back into the Olympics. One more Olympic to talk about. 2010 you defended the title what was it like going back defending your olympic gold medal and actually winning back-to-back golds um it, it was awesome i uh the year before um i'd had a really good year the year before but i'd also had our first event back that fall down in uh in chapelco in argentina i broke three vertebrae in my back um I overshot the finish kicker in a, in the time trial and just kind of like landed mid back um, and went home and it was kind of like, you know, it went undiagnosed. Like we didn't, I didn't actually like totally know that it was broken until about five years later, but I basically like went home, didn't sleep for like three months. Um, I made the transition to Kessler that fall. I, uh, was still trying to just ride for your ride boards and I was just getting slower and slower and, uh, the year previous to that. And I, uh, the first race, um, that winter was in December. And so I'd like, I'd broken my back in August, had just a shitty fall. Um, you know, I was just kind of home and depressed through the whole fall season. And, uh, um, and then I, I hit up Curtis Baca, um, where like that fall, because we didn't have a good wax tech situation with the team at that point. I was like, well, we're a year out, you know, I really felt like Curtis had been a big key component to my success in Torino and, uh, the team wasn't going to pay for him, but Lindsay, Jacob Ellis and I just decided to split his travel bill and to bring him on board. And so the first race that he came to was that uh, December race kind of right before Christmas over, um, in Switzerland and Arosa. And, uh, we kind of like, yeah, just like went on our own program that year where it was kind of like, I, I was really bummed. I, I wasn't happy with the U S team. I wasn't happy with the support that I was getting. And so, um, it kind of, became like a me versus them thing for a while. And that was like the energy that I needed to like get myself fired up because like at that point, you know, I was just so many years into it. And I think the hardest thing with border cross of like shutting your brain off and just like throwing yourself down the course as far as fast as you can, like the older you get, it gets harder to do that for sure. Mm. You know, it's like against all self-preservation instincts in the brain and I'm not, but I kind of, I got fired up because like I hadn't had a good season the year before cause I was still on my old free ride boards and I was just getting slower. And so Foley hadn't picked me for the world championship team that year, which I felt I was like lividly pissed. Like I had gone second, first, second in the last three world championships. No other American man had like made the podium yet. And I was just like, you know, like this is bullshit. Like how, how am I not picked for this team? And so I, called Curtis in. We went to a Rosa. I ended up winning that world cup. 
And uh, right before the final heat, I was uh, I was listening to Seek and Destroy by Metallica. And uh, I went up to Foley because I was the only American in the final. And I was like, hey, did I make the fucking U.S. team yet for world championships? <laughs> and uh, and he was kind of like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, like you can go now, you know. And and uh, so I, I ended up winning that final. And that kind of like kickstarted the year. And I um, had a really good season. I ended up second overall for the world tour that year. And uh, it just got me motivated again. And like... I, you know, went into the Olympic year still kind of feeling that me against the U.S. team because they still weren't paying for wax tax and all that and uh, went back to Argentina that next summer, back to Chapelco and uh, ended up getting second behind Pierre Valtier in that first World Cup and basically like stealing my Olympic spot in that first one. And I was feeling a little flippant after a few too many red wines that night and like sent this post out because we were like just starting to do all that stuff like sent a Facebook post like you know like putting the prices of like my plane ticket to Argentina and what it cost to get my wax tech there and it was like you know like going to the Olympics priceless like team Westcott one U.S. snowboard team zero <laughs> and uh, it must not have liked that no we got a call about an hour later from Forrester and uh right he was he was flipping out and i was like well if you guys want to pay my travel expenses back i could take that down and <laughs> uh so it was kind of funny but i i used that energy um through that whole year and uh you know kind of knew that things were going well like i I'd, I'd won a few of the time trials the week before at x games i won the time trial by almost a full second and uh made a huge mistake in the final and ended up basically like having to hit the brakes and let Holland pass. Cause I was off. I just made a mental mistake and was offline on a blind rollover. And so Holland ended up winning X games that year. I was second, but like I had such a margin on the time trial there that I just went into Vancouver with a ton of confidence. And like, you know, my dad had called me after X and he was like, well, I'm actually glad you didn't win X games. He's like, cause you're going to be so friggin' hungry next week. And I was like, mm. I, I am you know, and and then yeah and then we got to Vancouver and uh everything was pretty messed up like the the snow sucked um I don't think I finished like we were supposed to have four days of training and I didn't even finish a time trial run like I kept overshooting things and blowing up and like and you know, like I think I'd won like three of the five time trials so far that year. So I was confident in my riding, but like I literally hadn't put the course together top to bottom wow. prior to the time trial. And then I spun out in the time trial and uh, just kind of, yeah, made a huge mistake. And then uh, had to go back up and do a second time trial run, which then it was like, I was outside of the bubble so i'm like well i gotta be conservative enough that i get in like i can't try to win the time trial now because if i try to win and i screw up like then i'm gonna be one of the four dudes that's cut and uh so went up and kind of just had a conservative run but got through and then i was uh we were back down in the wax cabins and i was just down kind of like spinning on the bike getting my legs loosened up because like with the world cup, you do time trials on one day and race on another day. And with the Olympics, it's all in one day. So it's like, it's more, you know, it's more of a workload for you basically like, and you're going to be way more tired by the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So I was down spinning on the bike and Foley comes in and he like throws me, um, he threw out the bibs and I got mine last cause I'd qualified the worst for the U S team, but I got bib 17, which had been like my lucky number my entire life. Like it had been my soccer number for like 12 years growing up and, and, uh, I was just super stoked to get the bib. And then uh, something about like that moment, like, you know, I don't know how all the brackets work, but I know that like bib 17 is with the number one time trialer 16, 17 and 32. And uh, Alex Poland had won the, from Australia had won the time trial that day. And I kind of looked at Baca and was like, well, I guess we like crushed the hopes and dreams of Australia on the first run here today. <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, like I, it was a, I just kind of like snapped back into that, you know, me versus them moment because I was like, well, I'm not going to have lane choice all day. And 
but it was like, I got the black bib as like my choice. So it was like, okay, like on the dark horse bib all day, like I'll be coming from the worst gate. And, uh, and that was kind of how it went. Like I, I won that first run and then Nate and I were together on the second run and, you know, in the start gate, I was kind of like, oh, well, this run's going to be payback for my mistake last week. And so then I beat Nate in that second heat. And then, and then when we got to the semifinal, it was me and Nate and uh, two Austrians. And we just kind of, uh, you know, like stepped back for a second. I was like, okay, you know, I was like, we, we'd been joking around like after the Torino year because of uh, Talladega nights and, and Nate and I went on a run of like seven or eight podiums in a row together. And so like back then we were like doing shake and bake and, and I was like, okay, like let's both go to the finals of the Olympics here. Like let's work together. Hmm. And uh, yeah, we took down Mario Fuchs and Lucas Gruner in that one. Nate took the win in that semifinal, but I was just kind of like, whatever, like the, I just, we got to get to the final before anything else can happen. And then, uh, so then in between the semi and the final, we're up top. And Jeff Archibald calls me on the radio and he was just like, look, he'd been down in one of the broadcast things and was stop watching stuff. And he's like, you have the fastest split on the lower half of the course, but he's like, I'm worried about turn one. I'm worried about the chicane between turn two and three. And I'm worried about turn four. And he's like, those are all places where you could get pinched or hit. And so for that final, I had the all the way right gate. The first turn goes left. So it's like, I'm at a 20 foot disadvantage to get to that first turn. And Arch was just like, you know, he's like, you're riding super good. He's like, if you just can hold back a little bit and wait until turn four to go, he's like, you know, don't break or anything. But he's like, if you know, he's like, you don't have to force anything, but turn between the start and turn four, he's like, you can use those lower straightaways and get everything going down there. And so sure enough, like I come out of turn one, I'm in last, get to turn four, Nate got too front footed, he spun out and went down. And then, so I'm just looking um, at the young French rider and then at Mike Robertson and uh, Tony Ramon, the kid from France, you know, I'm kind of like going across that straightaway, gaining speed on him, gaining speed on him. And I, I hadn't raced against him much, but I knew, um, I knew that he wasn't a great turner and I knew that he was on boards with like a way longer side cut radius. Cause a bunch of the French were trying those at the time. And so I just kind of let him go wide, set him up for an inside pass. And then it was just uh, me and Robertson, but there was also like, for me, I'd been almost booting out. There was this kind of weird, it wasn't even a roller turn. It was like a flat turn with some rollers in it um before the second to last turn and so I kind of like hung back for that one because my heel cups had been dragging in that turn because it was so slushy all day and so got through that turn um and then knew that on I was trying to think I think it was turn six um I knew that on turn six it was a heel side turn for me it's like super reminiscent of Baker where you can just like go totally flat based with zero edge contact. And I was like, you know, this is going to set up this straightaway for me. I need to just like grease this turn and let it go. And, uh, you know, at that point, Robertson probably had like a 50, 60 foot lead on me. And I came out of that turn and the board just felt like it took off, like kind of just matched all those trainees across that last straightaway perfectly and it was like by the time I hit the takeoff of that last table I had so much more momentum on him passed him in the air and then uh you know my only worry was like getting t-boned in that final corner because like again like I just tried to just rail a toe side on the inside and it was like I was just waiting for him to hit the tail on my board and he didn't and then I was like okay like just get as small as you can from here to the finish line and try to like get aerodynamic. And then, uh, yeah, that one was just, it was so surreal to do it for the second time. And then, you know, like the energy that was there and like getting to do it in North America was, um, you know, just kind of meant so much more. And like with the injuries in between and, and all that stuff, it was, uh, it was a pretty surreal, surreal 
Is it significantly different winning two gold medals versus winning only one gold medal? Was the second time totally different than the first time? Yeah, I think so because, you know, especially with the ups and downs of like getting hurt in between, um, you know, I'd had a couple surgeries, like I'd been through some really low points and like not feeling healthy. And so it's like, you know, it's, it's so hard to do something where you're going to be ready for a day like that every four years. And so like the idea of actually like coming back and doing it um, was pretty you know, it, it meant a lot more to me because I'd been in lower places in between the 06 and the 2010 one. Let me ask you something. Uh, I wanted to just kind of uh, ask you in, in 2008, Sullivan and I actually met, we met at uh, 48 straight. There was a ski tour and it was in Sun Valley. And, uh, and I will say that I personally, when I was, I, I convinced the ski tour to let me race in that event. And I went to the top and Curtis Baca waxed my board. He waxed me up and I somehow by the grace of God qualified. But I qualified into the heat where I was sitting next to you and Cheevers <laughs> and Diebold. <laughs> and, uh, and I hadn't raced in 10 years, really, in any kind of – in any way. And, and Nate Galpin, a good friend of mine. Yeah, you know, Nate's awesome. Nate Moral said, of the story, Beav got smoked. <laughs> no, hey, hey, hey. I did not get smoked. But, but Nate okay. said he, – he said when you step into that, when you step into that uh, start gate and you look over at those guys, you say, thank you. You shake all their hands and you have a day of gratitude because you will never have this again. Um, <laughs> and I thought that was hilarious. But what, uh, talk to me just about being in the mental mindset to win. <laughs> um, I didn't do terrible, Sullivan. I know. I know That's you're thinking. Good. Sure. Well, and I, I know I was, I was there nursing a couple of broken ribs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Grandma yeah. and Abby decided to wrestle me late night in Japan. <laughs> Uh, a little bit prior to that and he took me down on a uh on a snowy street like right. i was just walking along a bunch of hoods couldn't hear anything and all of a sudden i'm like laying flat on my back on a, oh, on a road in japan and so i get up all frustrated and go to try to like tackle him into a snowbank and he fully judos me and comes around <laughs> with his elbow and i had a i had my camera in my chest pocket and it like popped two of my ribs off my sternum so that oh god that uh that 48 straight week was a little more of a party week of 48 hours for me than the racing <laughs> week. But uh, I remember that course being gnarly, that uh, downhill, that one kind of fall away downhill turn was badass. Yeah, so yeah, even, at actually, your best, even at your best, Beeb, you're not as good as Seth Hurt. I wanted to, yeah, okay, okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I want to say about that fall away right turn, I remember because I was right in the pack there, and on that, you could kind of air up into that right-hand turn, and I was right next to Diebold at the time, and right on Cheevers, and Cheevers was on the end. I literally came down compressed, and I just blew up, went flying into the gate. That was the air, went flying into the bean heading, and that was the end of it. But um, but tell me, about, tell me about the mindset that one needs to get into, stay composed through all that, you know, as a racer. And I think you guys were all there, and I was just like, oh, shit, hold on, hold on. <laughs> no, the, the mindset is gnarly, and it's uh, – you know, I think that was probably the thing that I struggled with the most in my career was like, I would watch Delarue and he was so good at like going to this place where you could just turn everything off and be able to like, want to just kill the guys next to you. Like, even though that's not what you're doing, but it's like, it's like going into battle. And especially like once you get through to those semifinals and finals with all those guys that are that good. And you know, I was always a little bit more passive. Like it was harder for me to get to that place. Like I could be super focused. And if my riding was going well, I would always try to be like out riding the field rather than like doing battle with the guys. And that was like the majority of my best events were like when I could win a time trial by a huge margin and just know that if like, I wouldn't even train with other people. I just train the course by myself and be working on my own snowboarding because it was like, I didn't have that same fighter mentality that someone like Delarue had. And, mm. uh, but you know, I'd have to tap into it sometimes. And like, you know, at the games and stuff, it was definitely enough to fire me up to find that place. But I think, you know, for me, that was a big component of why I didn't have more wins in my life. Cause like part of it was like, I just didn't give that much of a shit about it to like mm. really, you know, have that, combative mindset that you kind of had to have um mm. we were in Bagestein one night and uh it was a, it was a night race in Austria and 
Radoslav actually like T-boned both Zav and I into corner one and we went down and came through in uh, third and fourth and Zav came around the finish line in like one big huge toe side turn and just at like 30 miles an hour you know just Radoslav had a full face on and Zav just decked him like going 30 and just was standing over at him yelling at him in front French like just like oh, you know <laughs> don't ever do that again. And, uh, and I just, I would never, I never had that kind of fire where it was like, I wasn't going to go to blows in the course. It was like, if things were going to be all right, then I could, I could win the race. But, um, but that mindset is gnarly and you do have to get into a place where, you know, you're willing to get hurt and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and risk things. Cause it's like, you know, like if you're going to overshoot something by a mile, but you're like, well, I'm just going to stomp that into the flats to try to win this thing. And hmm. um, it's a, it's a gnarly place to get yourself into. Hmm. Crazy. Now, um, now you're kind of now transitioning in your life. You're, you're, you have purchased and bought into winter stick. Talk to me just about that kind of that element of your life and now being, you know, I'm going into, I'm doing business. You own a restaurant, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. And do you feel as competitive over winter stick as you did over competing at snowboard cross? <laughs> right. Well, you know, for me, the winter stick project is cool. The, the two partners that I got involved with, they'd owned the brand since 99 and, uh, you know, I, they were both CVA alums. I've known them a long time and I always kind of felt like they weren't, doing it justice, you know, like where there it's like in North America, it's the oldest running. I'd never known that Moss started in 71 until about a year ago. All of a sudden it was like Moss right. was 71, which I didn't realize, but like, you know, for us in North America, like I remember going into a shop as a young kid. Um, there's this place called skis or us in Waterville, Maine and like seeing the first winter stick that I ever saw with all the dimples on it. It was an old, like, purple and green round tail. And that was the first snowboard I ever saw in a shop. And it was something so foreign from what I saw in skateboarding, you know, that it was like, and being in Maine, it's like, yeah, you like, you don't have the powder to ride that. But, um, you know, now all these years later, like, you know, like having emailed with Dimitri and like, really like looked at their story and like his whole focus and like the um the piece that the Huffman brothers did on the um I forget what that series was called that they were doing but like you know the idea that those were guys were just going out in Utah because the conditions were so good and that they were really you know kind of more experiencing surfing on snow than what we would call snowboarding um, and now like having been involved in the company and knowing all these guys in Utah that call themselves winter stickers, like that it wasn't snowboarding for them, it was winter sticking and that it was all about the powder experience. Like for me, it's been really gratifying to like get involved in board shaping and setting up our factory at Sugarloaf and, and just kind of taking ownership of it and being like, you know, I want to keep the heritage of this brand alive because it's North America's original snow surfing brand. And, uh, it's really fun. Like we've got a, we've got a cool, um, the, the two guys that we have, the two engineers that are working at the factory are really smart. And so like, I can go there and be like, well, I'd like to do this. And like, they can bring those things to reality and I can, I can sit there and, you know, coach them on where I want the shape to go, but like they're making, making it happen. And, uh, it's been really fulfilling these last three years to get that factory going and to be working to keep that part of snowboarding history alive for me. So how hands are, on are you with the design the development of different boards and the actual manufacturing of these boards well the i i like so when i started with them um we were still being manufactured in the wagner factory and i basically jumped right in like i started going out and doing trips and going and staying and tell you ride in the summer and uh took over all the board design um pete you know i just work with pete wagner and after about a year and a half, like I'd been making boards already in Portland, Maine with a good old friend of mine, Greg Johnston, who was a snowboarder um, in the Sugarloaf community. And 
kind of once I made that switch to Kessler and had gotten off Rossi, I didn't have free ride boards. So I started making these boards um, with Greg. He had a little brand in Portland, Maine called Team 8. And so I started making all my Alaska boards um, every spring with him. And then he just kind of went through a life transition and needed to get out, you know, started a family, bought a house, all that stuff, and needed to get out of, you know, doing, he was doing about 200 custom boards a year, but he had a whole process down to be able to do them totally custom. And so at that point I bought all his manufacturing equipment and had it sitting in a storage container up in Carabasset. And then when Tom Fremont Smith approached me from winter stick and he was like, look, we'd like to have you start working with us. So I was just like, yeah, I, I think it's time, you know, because earlier on they'd actually had it at a pretty good place. Like from the late nineties through, Oh six, they were doing about 4,000 boards a year globally. And, um, this factory called focus up in Chicoutimi, Quebec took their pre-order money after the SIA trade show and shut its doors and, uh, basically ran with a million dollars of their cash. And so they went back, took family money, paid back the retailers so that winter stick wouldn't be in, have its name in bad standing. And it just kind of became in an incubation period. That was when they found Pete Wagner. And so like if a direct order came through the website, Pete would build it. I mean, they were really at that point just doing Tom Burt's model and the Swallowtail. And I just felt like we could do so much more with it that, um, you know, there's what we're seeing, you know, like of the probably the most influential trip I had for me was um, doing the powder board test for Transworld back in 06. Uh, Brian Gucci and I went with Kurt Hoy um, up to, and Nick Hamilton up to the CMH Galena Lodge. And we had like four days to ride with like 40 different shapes in the heli. We basically like trade off every run. You just like take a new board out of the basket. And that was like, for me, the most in-depth experience I'd gotten to have of experiencing a bunch of shapes. And that was kind of like, for me, from that trip on in the spring of 06, I always started riding directional powder boards whether I was free riding, whether I was like going out to just ride for fun in the half pipe, anything like that trip with Brian, like really changed my thinking about the snowboards that I wanted to ride. And so then it was like, okay, when I started building stuff with Greg, I could kind of go in and have a blank slate because he used a moldless process. And so we could do whatever we wanted shape wise. And I wasn't constricted that way, which, you know, when Zav and I were doing stuff with Rosie, we would want to make new shapes and they were just like, well, sorry, like, you know, the molds are too expensive and they wouldn't let us do it in those years. And so it always felt like you were hamstringed. And so it was really fun to then be able to be like, okay, like to the winter stick guys, it's like, look, I have a snowboard factory sitting in a storage unit. There's a barn that Sugarloaf isn't using. I got Sugarloaf to give us a dollar a year lease on the building. There's a chairlift coming out of the building. And it's an old enough chairlift that they didn't have a way to break the electrical feed off. So we get free electricity from them. And uh, so I was just like, you know, like I want to do this here and I want to have control over it. And I want us to be able to like, you know, be proud that we're manufacturing boards in the United States again, that like we're creating a few manufacturing jobs in a county in Maine. That's one of the poorest counties in the state. Um, and so like the two partners, Tom and Chris were into it. And so I was just like, okay, like, you know, like I'll do this if I can have control over shaping the boards and, and pushing the direction where I want to see it go. And so, you know, this, some, this past summer was our third full summer. Um, you know, when I, I try to like bring my family back to the East coast, we've got to kind of work around my stepson's school system. Um, you know, his dates of being here in Whistler and school. And then we go back to Sugarloaf in the summers. And then I try to go in a little bit every day and, you know, mostly I'll do the dirty room work, like go in and cut the boards out and, you know, do the routing and grinding and drilling out inserts and all that stuff. We've got a good young kid who's super good with the, the layups. And, um, and then I, the, the computer work on the CNC is above my head. So, um, I just let those guys handle all that, but it's, uh, it's really fun. Like, you know, like even just for Baker this last week, like making some adjustments to the board because it's like, well, I feel like the last couple of years it hasn't been finishing the turn enough. So we're going to make this change and then see how it works. And, um, and for me, that's been really gratifying, you know, like last spring, one of the big things I really wanted to do and we didn't get to it for a little while because the first guy that we brought out from Colorado, um, to 
be doing the engineering part of it was a little closed minded as to like, you know, he'd worked at Wagner for a long time and he felt like he had kept winter stick alive, even though he was just like one of the shop guys at Wagner. I was like, well, no, I said own winter stick and kept winter stick alive. But, uh, so we, we transitioned him out about a year and a half ago. And then since we got him out, it's been way better because you can just like bring an idea into this guy, Rob Lou, who's our head engineer and we'll put it together, you know, in about an hour and then, you know, hit, hit print on the CNC and start cutting the cores out and start putting stuff together. And so it's been, you know, super fun for me to be able to have control over a process like that and to be shaping that future of keeping stick alive. And so tell me a little bit about the winter stick line, because I know you have this kind of traditional swallowtail board. I think that you have probably a, a pro model or a model that you designed obviously. Yeah. But then you also have a lot of custom boards, it sounds like, as well. And from what I've seen, at least, with the, the newer winter stick boards, is they all have beautiful uh, wood veneer top sheets. Tell me a little bit about the line, how you came about kind of figuring out a product line, and then yeah. how much of it's custom in production. Yep. Um, yeah, so what we've got going right now, um, this year we did a complete redesign on the traditional swallow um, to make them more rider friendly when you're not just in deep powder. You know, it's like a lot of times you're going to have long traverses in or out of terrain sections. And um, I wanted those to really work in all conditions. And so um, we did a redesign on that. So it's kind of like if you start with the swallowtails, we've got the original swallowtail shape, um, which has been slightly reworked this year. We've got the next board, which is called the Valer, um, which is a kind of modern swallowtail. Like it was, I, I wrote a 69 version of it for filming for Warren Miller last spring up at Wiggly's and it's like more wide, but a traditional side cut, you can kind of ride it a little more centered. So for like doing errors and stuff like that, it feels really well balanced. It also works super good on hard pack, but a super long, uh, low entry nose so that it planes up really quick and, and floats really well. Then the next Wally in the line is called uh, the Party Wave, which is kind of a hybrid of my pro model and something a little wider. Like kind of, I would take this probably for like more steep riding for myself. Like, but it's also like you can rail turns on it going switch because it's got a kicked up swallowtail. So it's kind of like something that like some kids would take and like be like, yeah, this is like my swallowtail looking park board, but it's a longer side cut radius board. So it works well on big mountain. Like I wanted something where I could kind of have my pro model shape, but then step, step up to like Alaska style terrain. Right. Um, then we've got Tom Burt's pro model and that's in a signature line, my pro model in a signature line. We brought Rob Kingwell on, um, a couple of years ago and he's actually helping us doing some work as brand manager too. Um, and then his is kind of a more, you know, Rob rides switch a lot more than I do. And so his is kind of like a directional twin, um, for his days at Jackson. Um, and then the other real kind of like, you know, cornerstone of the thing we want, I really wanted to re release the round tail, um, which was, right. you know, we had the swallowtail and the round tail. And those were kind of like the first two, real pow boards and um and really the round tail was like the original fish um and i've always liked you know going back to that trip in 06 i've always liked highly tapered boards because in good pow you can it can start to be like you're surfing where like you've got a smaller tail so you can break three-dimensionally not breaking sideways but like you can be pointing something and using it like you're in the pocket on a surfboard and and slowing yourself down when you need to that way um, but a highly tapered shape, large nose, um, again, that also carves unbelievably on hard pack. Um, and then the custom component of it is that, you know, we offer those boards, like one of the things that for me, like in the years of riding pipe, when I was on the Burton team, like, you know, Terrier's board, the balance was the best pipe board. But for someone like me that had, you know, two and a half foot sizes smaller or larger than Terrier, I couldn't ride it effectively because I was always either dragging a heel cup or dragging my toes. And so I really felt like no one in the industry, like in the major manufacturers, it's like, yeah, there's like one wide model, but there isn't individual shoe sizes. And right. um, 
I really felt like one of the components missing in snowboarding was like being able to have, you know, a perfect waist width board to your own foot size so that your snowboarding experience is better so that you're like properly pressuring your edge. You're never dragging. And because we use a system without molds where we can do that. So we can take any board in the line. Um, we can make it specifically for that person's weight by like, we do all our own cores in house. We have our own wood shop upstairs. Um, so we can, you know, profile the core to someone's weight, make it exactly whatever waist width they need that they're having a better snowboard experience. And then we can also just do anything. I mean, that's like the fun part of like having a system without the molds is like people will come to us and be like, oh, I've always wanted to do this kind of a board. And so we can also do the full blank template too, where right. it's like, you can make anything you want. And so and how many boards do you guys make in, in custom versus production boards? Um, the production has been smaller than custom so far. Like basically I think we did about 250 custom boards last year. And so a lot of those are something that we have in the, the range of, you know, in the line, but then we're customizing it to that person's, size, shape, putting some kind of different graphic on it, whatever. Um, and then the, you know, the other part of like the wood, the wood part of it is like, we are trying to do what we can, like the, you know, the snowboard industry creates a ton of plastic waste. And so the first time that I actually saw sidewalls being milled and you'd see how much plastic dust is created for each sidewall of every snowboard, it was like, right. well, we can also make these out of wood. Um, the bonding principles of the wood is actually better because wood is porous versus the, the sidewall material isn't. So like, I mean, you know how easy it is to blow a sidewall out when you hit a rock. And what we found so far in these last few years is that like the edges actually bond better to a hard rock maple sidewall. Um, and you'll have better durability in the long run. Um, and you're also like removing one of the biggest plastic components of the board. Like, so we try to encourage people to go that way where it's like the only plastics in the board or the base. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, ultimately like we offer things with, with plastic top sheets as well, but we try to, uh, we try to get everyone to experience the, the whole thing of having wood sidewalls because the other thing is like you hold a plastic sidewall out and it just droops. There's no life in it. There's no energy. It doesn't create any power in the board. It doesn't, you know, there's no energy in it. And so, I actually really feel like there's a better feeling in having a completely wood board where, you know, your sidewalls are also giving you power in your ride as well. Cool. Okay. So where, where do you see winter stick years from here? Where do you see Seth Westcott years from now? Where are you going to be 10 years from now? Where's the brand going to be 10 years from now? Um, I think it's going to be in a good place. I mean, we've just been, you know, I was just over the 20 days that I was in Japan. Um, one of my old friends from CVA, Aki Matsumoto, who grew up in Nagano, he's taking on doing our distribution over there. He handles all Jeremy's stuff for Jones over there. Um, you know, we just started a collab with TJ Brand over there. And then I, the custom model has been working really well for us. And then what we need to what we need to concentrate on the rest of this spring is just finding the niche markets, you know, like going to a Travis McLean at radio and Aspen places where people are willing to buy a beautiful handcrafted board for $1,500 and not bat an eye at the price. Um, right. We're, you know, basically the last two winters we've been busy the entire winter making custom boards, like from October through the end of April. So like that part of the component is working really well. Now we just got to like, get enough retailers opened, um, that we're keeping the shop busy in the summer. But, uh, it, yeah, it's, this is three years in and, you know, with anything like that, like jump starting it from where it was, um, to now, like, you know, we've basically doubled our growth each year that we've been starting. And I, I would like to kind of just cap it where you're like, okay, we're going to make 500 beautiful snowboards a year. If you want one, get your order in early. Like that's what we're going to have. That's what makes our shop profitable. That, it's what keeps us going year round. And, uh, and that's, you know, a manageable, a manageable number for the number of guys we have working to be comfortable, have a good work environment and, uh, and put some beautiful boards out there in the world each year. Cool. All right. Um, go uh, ahead, final, you. final question here. Sully, right. Okay. You want me to... Sure. Yeah. Hey, okay. So Seth, um, let me ask you here, you know, uh, 
you've been in this in the world of snowboarding for nearly 30 years now you've most certainly you know built a life around that um thinking back to that kid that worked all summer to buy that burton board you know um what's the legacy that you hope to leave what's the indelible mark you hope to leave on snowboarding um you know years from now well I, you know all I would really want to leave is a mark of enjoyment. You know, it's like for me at home in Maine, it's been really cool to have the involvement that I've had with Sugarloaf over the years from, you know, getting the ski area to jump into doing parks to, you know, do an excavation for half pipes, getting contest series going there regularly. Like this year is going to be our ninth year of our Sugarloaf bank slalom. Um, you know, like, I was, you know, I really like go back to how fortunate I was to like be able to have a guy like Jeremy and a guy like Mark Fawcett come there mm -hmm. and be able to kind of follow in their footsteps. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's been funny this last year because even like the U S teams like, Oh, you got to make a retirement announcement. And it's like, well, what would I be retiring from? Like, yeah, I'm never going to do another this event, but I'm not retiring from snowboarding. I'm not like, there's a whole list of things that, you know, like I just want to have more time. Like, you know, Terry was telling me this last week. He's like, oh, we kind of have like a triple crown. If you come, you know, like come up to Rick Scranton, come to yeah. these events. He's like, we have this thing going in the spring. And it's like, there's just more, you know, as I get older, like I want to be split boarding more. I want to spend more time in the backcountry. You know, my wife's a full ACMG ski and mountaineering guide. So like for us to be able to have time to be going deeper into the backcountry and like, you know, I want to get my daughter snowboarding as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just enjoying it more and more. Like I, I always liked, uh, Craig Kelly's quote about snowboarding more and more quietly and, uh, you know, getting to step away from having spent all these years of like putting bibs on or just being on planes to go to another event. Like I love snowboarding more than I've ever loved snowboarding, you know, like that part of it has never changed for me. But I loved Craig's quote of like just wanting to ride more and more quietly and be able to go out and enjoy it for yourself and and have a pure experience with it because it's like you know there's runs that I had when I was a little kid like before I was even allowed to go to a ski area where you're like I remember having my Walkman on being out in the woods as it's getting dark and like you know threading this little tree section just right and like having these experiences in powder and like just having that moment by yourself for the enjoyment of what it feels like is more and more like what's, what's driving me. And like, it's been really fun for me to, you know, be able to start spending most of my year up here in the Whistler community and have mm. more and more of a network of people that like I can go into the backcountry with and go just experience better terrain with and better days of snowboarding. And, um, and so I just, you know, it's like, I, everyone like actually Curtis Sizzik was giving me crap last year at Baker. Cause he was like, aren't you ready to enter pro masters yet? And I was like, well, no, like I'm still trying to win this. Thing. And, uh, but it's, you know, it's like seeing someone like Dirksen finally get his win last year or like just watching Terry a ride and temple ride every year. And you know, the more that I've gotten to know Tom Burt, it's like those of us that, started in this sport before it was accepted like there wasn't it wasn't about being cool it was like about getting away from whatever you, you know it was like we were skateboarders growing up and like when you lived in a place that had shitty winters but also had shitty skateboard seasons because like there was hardly any tar like this was the best alternative to like realize your skateboard dreams and so yeah you know like i just want to keep going on that path and keep enjoying the sport and you know like keep growing winter stick and keep having moments by myself out in the mountains where you just get enjoyment out of it and uh and get have that all for yourself <laughs> stay fly guys On behalf of Mark Sullivan and The Beave, thanks for listening to The Snowboard Project. Remember, ride fast, take chances, dream big, and take action. And for God's sake, don't be a... Don't forget to support Advertising Free Snowboarding Media at Patreon.com. The Snowboard Project. The Snowboard Project. The Snowboard Project.